So today we're talking about um, a doctrine called uh, the perseverance of the saints, which sounds really cold uh, and stale, uh, but this is a really personal subject. It's a really practical subject. And this is one of those subjects where um, on the one hand, you can talk about this in a really cold way, like this really uh, um, cold, emotionless way. Uh, but then you also need to think about it from a practical way, because pe people do leave church. People do walk away from God. People do claim to have been Christians, but say they're not Christians anymore. So how are you supposed to think about this? How should Christians think about this? Um, the... <laughs> just be just because something is really personal doesn't mean we can't know what we believe about it. We can search scriptures, and scripture has answers for this question. What are you supposed to think about someone who, who claims she used to be a Christian, but says she's walked away from it and no longer wants anything to do with it? What are we supposed to think about that person? Is did the, has the was the person never a Christian to begin with, and is that the explanation, um, or did the person forfeit her faith? So it's extremely personal, but what we, as we think about this, we're going to think about this from, from both angles. One, just uh, may, maybe a, a cold and dispassionate look at what does the scripture say? And that, that discussion will help us think about real world personal things uh, as we think about this. So this should be fun. The, there's a bunch of ways we can do this. I decided to just have you read uh, the chapter in Wayne Grudem's book for an overview. I'm not going to be talking about his chapter. You can ask any questions you want about it, mm -hmm. but he lays out, you know, the differences um, pretty well, as well as anybody. Um, I don't know if you had the chance to do it today. And if you didn't, that's fine, because I just sent it out about four hours ago. There's a beautiful sermon by John Wesley uh, called titled A Call to Backsliders. John Wesley is the, the founder, the father of the Methodist Church. The Methodist Church used to be the Anglican Church in the U.S., but it splintered off from that and became the, the Methodist Church. Um, and Methodists believe salvation can be lost. That's what Wesley believed. His brother Charles wrote many of our famous hymns, Hark the Herald, Angels Sing, was written by good old Chuck Wesley. Um, and Charles and his brother both believed salvation could be lost. They had that perspective. And this, this sermon, A Call to Backsliders, um, takes this out of this theoretical realm and lets you see what a loving and kind pastor thinks about this issue. And you, you can see his heart as to why this is such an important issue. And you can see a different perspective on what to think about this issue, because you Christians know people and pastors have to deal with people who claim they used to love the Lord, but now they've walked away. So what are you supposed to, what are you supposed to think about that? So we'll pray and um, anyone can ask anything they want. Uh, and then we'll, we'll go through and look at some, look at one side that says you, you, you can't, your salvation can't be forfeit because God keeps you, God protects you, uh, which I think is the biblical view. And we'll look at another view that says, um, unless you stick with the Lord, uh, you're in danger of falling away. And we'll look at some passages for and against to, to see why Christians have come to different conclusions on this. We're going to look at two in particular because we don't have all day. Um, we're going to look at John chapter 10 and we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 6. And those are the two big passages that, that each, each side looks at and, and clings to and uses as justification for, for its view. So that's what we'll do. So we'll pray and we'll, uh, we'll chat and take a look at this. So let's do that. Dear Lord, we come to you today in Jesus' name. Lord, help us to want to know your word. Help us to help us not to be this cold uh, intellectual exercise, but a, a, real, a real opportunity for us to look at what scripture says uh, so we can make sense of the things we see in our lives and the lives of our friends and perhaps family members and the life of our congregation. Help us to make sense of what we see by what we study from your word. Help us not to let our, our emotions um, override what your scripture says, but help us to search your scripture, come to the best conclusion about what it says so that we can then explain and, and best understand what we see happening 
in our Christian life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So do you guys have any questions that you, you really want to talk about? Otherwise, I have notes and I could just talk for like an hour and you all will be sleeping or something. And I, we could do that. But if you have questions you really want to talk about, I can either answer them immediately or I can sort of write them down and I'll, I'll mention them as I go through uh, the stuff I have prepared. But uh, are there things or questions or scripture you guys really want to talk about that you find yeah. troubling or you've always wanted mm -hmm. to know about? Yeah. What is, what does Gruden mean when he says the perseverance of the saints? What he's, is, what's his, is, is he specifically talking about you can or cannot lose salvation? Is, is that where he goes with this? Uh, yeah. Grudem, Grudem says you cannot lose your salvation. You can't. Um, so there's different ways people have had to, people who believe that like, like our church does, uh, you can't lose your salvation. They framed it in two big, two, two different ways. One is you can just talk about eternal security. You know, if you belong to the Lord, you're, you're eternally secure. He's got you and no one can pluck you out of his hand. So eternal security, some of you might've, might've heard it phrased that way. Probably a better, probably a more, a better way to phrase it is to call it, call it perseverance. Um, if you're a true Christian, you will always persevere in Christ until the end. You know, you'll, you might wander away, but you'll come back. A uh, true Christian will always persevere in faith for Christ. So it's saying the same thing, but it's, it's explaining it in different ways. <laughs> and Aries is going away. Goodbye, Aries. Hi. Okay. Uh, hold on one second. Okay, so yeah, that's, that's all that Grudem is saying. He's talking about eternal security, and I think it's better described as you know, a real Christian will persevere in his faith and stick with the Lord um, until the end. Some people stick better than others. Well, I could see wandering away and stuff like that and, and having a bad day here and there. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, some of these big names, there was a big name who just recently came out and said, I've lost my faith. And I don't really truly know what they're talking about or if they ever were a Christian in the first place. And I don't know. I don't know what to do with a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's hard because one, you don't know the person. So, yeah. I mean, if, if, if you knew the person, you could say, oh, you're never a Christian pal, <laughs> you know? Um, but if you don't know the person, it's hard to say. So if you believe in perseverance of the saints, or I'll call it, there's two models. I'll call them something different. I'll call it the, the kept by God model, which says, if you're a Christian, God will always keep you. He'll always protect you. He'll always, he'll never let you go. Okay. And so therefore you'll, you'll persevere. So that's the kept by God model. And the other one is the danger of falling away model where, um, those people say, um, that, um, you're saved by grace and, and, and everything else, but you can, um, you can fall into sin and not care about the Lord and you can, you can fall away from the faith. And there are people in the Bible who it seems were Christians, but they walked away like Saul, King Saul. Uh, what about Ananias and Sapphira? What about Demas who Paul mentions in second Timothy? He says, Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world. Um, now, depending on which filter you use for what to think about this question, you'll answer it in two different ways. Someone from the kept by God model, which, which is our model, would say, well, Demas was, Demas was never a Christian. He either was never a Christian or he'll come back because a true Christian always comes back. Someone who takes the other view, the in danger of falling away model, would say, well, um, he might have been a Christian, but he, he just walked away from Jesus. And uh, he, God will welcome him back, but he's forfeited his faith. And uh, if he, he can come back if he wants, but he better repent um, or else he's, gonna, he's in danger of hellfire. So it, they're two totally different ways of, of answering the question. And it all depends on what you think about the issue that we're going to talk about today. Um, Adrian typed Hebrews six, verse four. Yeah, that is, that's, that's the passage we're going to look at, uh, for the falling away view. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk, we'll talk about it. Yeah, Ralph. Uh, 
my brother-in-law, and this didn't happen to me, but he had a really close friend, strong Christian man. They had spent years in fellowship together, very close. And he came, became depressed and shot himself. <clears throat> so, of course, that was a heartbreak for everybody. But the question is, you know, is it a sin to kill yourself? And, you know, you see once in a while people who are depressed. And I mean, you can't talk to them. They're just totally out there somewhere. And they think, you know, they were Christians and then they get into this depression, which you can say, well, maybe that was a chemical imbalance or a medication imbalance or, or something. Uh, I don't know. But the question is, you talk about, well, they'll come back. Well, he's not coming back if he's dead. So I don't know how you deal with that. Yeah, I've, you know, you're not the first person who's asked me this question. And I, I really don't, I don't know where I, I, I don't know where the question comes from. I don't know anything in the Bible that says if you kill yourself, you've lost your salvation or you must not be a believer. Um, but it's obviously floating around somewhere in Christian circles because a lot of people have that question. It's not an, it's not like that used to be taught in the 70s, but now no one talks. I've, you know, I've had people have asked me that question, um, but I don't think, I don't think that's correct. Um, but yeah, Adrian, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you know, in the in the church that we grew up in, um, they would always tell us that it was because you were going to die with sin still, you know, on your your record or whatever, because you weren't able to ask for forgiveness. But to me, I always thought that was more like the Catholic thing where you have to go in and, you know, do your repentance in order to be re forgiven or whatever. Yeah, that that does sound like that does sound like Roman Catholic thinking that that's not a biblical idea. Um so I, I don't I don't want to demean anyone who believes that. Uh, and if you are thinking of killing yourself, then please let me know. But I just I, I don't believe that that's correct. I don't. It's it's out there somewhere though. I just don't know why people think that. Um, I don't. Um, so yeah, I don't. Like Forrest Gump. That's all I got to say about that. Was the person you can the same question? Was the person saved? Well, this particular person had quite a bit of evidence and quite a few years of strong service for the Lord doesn't mean he was saved, but at least as my brother-in-law was convinced and he's a really strong Christian. Uh, and it was pretty shocking to them and, and they were trying to fathom it too. And I never did hear the answer on that. I don't, I mean, off the cuff, I don't think that someone taking his own life is cause to question someone's salvation. Uh, I don't think that should put a big asterisk on the person's life if the person's life shows love for the lord faithfulness and a depression or a sudden awful event results in him taking his life i don't think that calls into question the person's salvation um i'm open to be challenged if if i'm overlooking something but i don't i don't see how how that means the person might not be a christian Does anyone else have anything they wanted to chat about or make sure we talk about as we go through um, the topic today? Okay, so I'll do I'll do this. Um, this 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 controversy. Um, the two sides of this controversy are really entrenched, and depending on who you talk to, you have popular. Bible teachers and preachers who might feel extremely strongly about this um, on each side. And if you feel really strongly about something, sometimes you don't represent the other side very well and you're uncharitable and sort of mean. And this, this has happened with this issue because it's bound up with a bunch of other things. So just, just to keep this sane, I'll just say that this controversy for, for what we're going to talk about today, it's been going on since the 1600s since at least the Protestant Reformation in Europe. And you had the same two sides that I mentioned before. The, the same two sides sort of solidified then, two different ways of looking at the scriptural evidence. Um, you had the, um, the, the more reformed crowd on the one hand, who uh, led by a man named uh, Jacob Arminius, who um, were open to the idea that you could walk away from the Lord. I think that saying salvation can be lost is a wrong way to frame it. Um, it's not like someone, it's not like God steals your salvation from you. They looked at the scripture, they looked at scriptural evidence like Hebrews chapter six that Adrian put in the, in the chat and other places and said, you know, it looks like people can walk away from God because Jesus warns about apostasy, 
writer of Hebrews talks about, seems to talk about apostasy. Um, the apostle Paul talks about, you should do this and this and this if you indeed are a believer. So they're like, you know, I think it's possible that you can walk away from God. You can fall away. You don't lose your salvation. You walk away. You give it up. Um, Jacob Arminius didn't specifically say uh, in this formal, uh, he didn't specifically say that you could lose it, but he said he's open to the idea and thinks it's possible. And this was in 1610 uh, when he and his father has released a short statement in, in five different sections that outline their views on salvation and this is one of the things and in response the reform the more reformed side uh, i think i said jacob arminius was the more reformed side but i was wrong um the, the more reformed side reacted really angrily and they're very upset and called arminius and his followers heretics and said that no um a real christian will persevere uh, God keeps his sheep, keeps his people. No one will pluck them out of his hand. And if you think that you can lose your salvation, then you're a heretic. So you can see there's a lot of charity going on right away um, in that fun discussion. So there's that. Those are those are the two. You know, th those are the two options that all that all lay out here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to what we usually do is for these classes is I just show you the, what the New Hampshire confession says. Uh, the New Hampshire confession is, it's a Baptist confession. It dates from 1833 and it's a really good summary of what the Bible says. It's not the Bible, but it sums things up. It's, it's better than just saying the Bible says um, it, it sums things up. The New Hampshire confession is the basis for the regular Baptist, which is what our church is a part of. It's also the basis for the Southern Baptist statement of faith, and it's it's extremely influential. So I think it's a good I think it's a good summary. So to get everything on the table, I'll just put that up there, and you guys need to tell me if it doesn't show up on the screen because I did this last time and no one said anything. And then when I went to put the video online, I saw that the screen never got shared, and everyone just pretended like they could see what I was looking at. So don't, you can't do that. <laughs> I was like, no one said anything. They're looking at a screen that says, welcome to Zoom, and no one said anything. <laughs> <laughs> there, were, I, there were even people nodding in the videos. I was highlighting things that weren't there. I'm like, how does that even work? <laughs> okay, so, all right. We can't make this mistake again. Just trying to humor you. <laughs> yeah, I know. You, you did a really good job because I never, I would never have known that no one could see anything. So here we go. Still awake. <laughs> Okay. Can you see the screen? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so this is what we're going to, to look at on the perseverance of the saints. So if you want a quick cliff notes, you know what, what, what does the Bible say? I think this is a very trustworthy guide. So this is where, this is what I'm going to use. So as, as we talk about everything today and at the end of it, you're like, you know, what, what is, what is an answer that I can rely on to start with? As I look at this myself, just go back and look at the 1833 New Hampshire Confession or look at this video and find the spot and you can just see it here. So here it is. Um, we believe that such only are real believers as endure unto the end. How do you know if someone's a real Christian in the end? I mean, how do you really know? They'll endure to the end. Yeah. They'll stick with Christ all the way. Maybe there will be some bad detours, but they'll, they'll get back on route. And, uh, and, and they'll stick with Christ until the end. And there's different scripture references. And that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors. You have all kinds of people who say they're Christians. How do you know? How do we know that someone is a Christian? They will persevere in their union with Christ. They will, they will stick with Christ. It doesn't mean they won't wander away for a while or have a bad day, a bad month, maybe a bad year, but they will stick with Christ and they'll come back to Christ's family, Christ's church, to the community. In the end, they will come back. It's the grand mark. They'll persevere. A special providence watches over their welfare. Jesus's words in John 10 uh, no one can pluck them out of his hand. God keeps his people, protects them. 
and they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. So that is, that's the, the, the Cliff Notes explanation that I believe is really faithful and other, other confessions of faith say the same sort of thing, but I like the New Hampshire confession. We have, um, you also have Romans chapter eight, verses 31 to 39, which talks about God's love, how he saved us. He, he justified us. He's going to, there's like this chain, there's the chain leading from uh, to him choosing us all the way until he glorifies us. Um, some people call it this, this golden chain of redemption where um, God, God has chosen us and he's never going to, to let us go or to let us fall away because he has chosen us. He, in at Romans chapter 8, verse 30, he said, those who God decided in advance would be conformed to his son, he also called. Those whom he called, he also made righteous. Those whom he made righteous, he also glorified. So there's like this chain. God chooses you. He calls you. He makes you righteous. And then he's going to glorify you. This, this, this highway leading all the way to Christ from him choosing you wherever you are all the way to Christ. And um, Jesus intercedes for us. If Jesus always lives to make intercession for the people who belong to him, how can they, how can they fall away? You know, that, that doesn't seem to, that didn't seem to work very well. If Jesus always lives to taught to advocate for us to the father, then I don't think we're going to, I don't think we're going to wander away. We'll always stick with him sometimes better than sometimes better sometimes than others, but we'll always stick with him. Um, The apostle John talks about Christians. If you're a Christian, you've been born from God. You've been born from God's seed. So you'll reflect the characteristics of your heavenly father. I don't know how that can be undone. That's in first John three, nine. You know, you, you look like your father or mother. You, you, you can see your parents in yourself. When you look at a baby, you can see the mom and dad in the baby. It, there's like a physical, there's a physical connection that can't be denied. And John's point in 1 John 3, when he's making that analogy, is that, you know, there, there's a spiritual um, resemblance. If we're God's children, we're going to reflect his values in this world. There's, there's nothing, it's like inevitable right? And how can that be reversed exactly? Um, And then we have John 10, which we'll look at in a minute. But those are the, there are other, you know, there are other things you can throw in there, but those are the big arguments for, no, God keeps his people and he he always protects them. And his people are, are, his people can always rest secure knowing that they're being protected by their savior who lives, always lives to make intercession for them. And we'll talk about John 10 in a minute after I talk about the, the other view, to be fair. But, um, but that's it. Do you guys have thoughts or questions? Does that gel with what you guys were taught growing up? Or are there things, nuances in it that are different? Or what are your guys' thoughts? Well, I grew up a Catholic, so you weren't supposed to murder <laughs> <laughs> And then, you know, I had a wife who was an Adventist and they, they believe that you can lose your salvation. Okay. But it always seemed kind of, I, I, I looked into it back then, but I, I just don't recall what I looked into, but it just seemed kind of stupid to think that here, here, here is this person who is saved and then, okay, the next week I'm not saved. And then the following week, I am saved again. And then the next week, <laughs> I don't know. It seemed really stupid. <laughs> it seemed like, come on, give me, put some meat on this. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Joe's being quiet. Usually he's chatting up a storm. Okay, um, I'll show you, I'll show you what the, what the other side says. Um, the other side basically talks about this, and there, there are like three things that the other side uh, puts forward, and we we need to be we need to be um, 
we need to take this seriously and not just, you know, say, oh, these people are absurd or something like that. Um, the three things are, number one, the Bible seems to warn of apostasy. The Bible warns about people who think they belong to God. And, you know, they, they don't. Um, Jesus warned in, uh, in Matthew 24. I'll turn to Matthew 24. Jesus said, what did Jesus say? Ah, um, Jesus is talking about the end, you know, when the tribulation begins in Matthew 24. He's talking about um, wars and rumors of wars, the signs of, of the times. He says in chap uh, Mark 20, Mark, Matthew 24, verse 8, but all these things are just the beginning of the sufferings associated with the end. They will arrest you, abuse you, and they will kill you. All nations will hate you on account of my name. At that time, many will fall away. They will betray each other and hate each other. So they say, well, you know, it looks like... Uh, it looks like people can can mm. fall away. Jesus' words say it. The Bible says it. That makes it so, and I believe it. So, you know, what are you supposed to what are you supposed to do with that? So what I'm saying is when people, when responsible people say, or when Christian when some Christian traditions say, I think you can fall away from the Lord, they're not being stupid. They're looking at Hopefully they're looking at they're looking at scripture like this and they're saying, well, you know, there's something we need to deal with here. In First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, we read Paul is talking about um, learning from the generation that was in the wilderness. They saw so many miracles from God and yet they um, disobeyed him and then they were punished in the wilderness. And he says in First Corinthians 10, verse 11, these things happened to them as an example and were written as a warning for us to whom the end of time has come. So those who think they are standing need to watch out or else they may fall. Well, bam, there it is. You know, so it sounds like you can fall away. And then there's the Hebrews passages, which Adrian mentioned, and that's, we'll talk about one of them. And so that's number one. That's reason one. Reason two is the Bible seems to show us people who do walk away from the faith. The question is whether, whether they really walked away from the faith or whether they're just being punished for their unfaithfulness um, to the Lord. Mm. You have Saul, King Saul, Ananias and Sapphira. You have Demas. You have the false teachers who Peter talks about and, you know, in Second Peter chapter 1. You know, what do you do, with, what do, you do with, with Demas? What are you supposed to do with this guy? Um, so there, there, these are real, these are real questions. Um, Paul said that Demas has forsaken him because he loved this present world. He talks about in first Timothy one, uh, chapter one, verses 19 to 20. He talks about two people who are awful folks, uh, Hymenius and Alexander, first Timothy one, 19 and 20. And he said, well, if I typed it correctly, I might actually bring it up. He says, um, I'll read 1 Timothy 1, 18 to 20. He says, Timothy, my child, I'm giving you these instructions based on the prophecies that were once made about you. So if you follow them, you can wage a good war because you have faith and a good conscience. Now, here it is. Some people have ruined their faith because they refuse to listen to their conscience, such as Hamanius and Alexander. I have handed them over to Satan so that they can be taught not to speak against God. Or your translation might say, I've handed, over, handed them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. So, um, you know, it sounds kind of suggestive. So number two, they say, hey, people, walk, people fall away from the Lord all the time. And there it is. And... The third reason is, well, we know people who say they're not Christians anymore. What are you going to do about it? How do we explain it? And that's a good question. Um, that's a really good question. So I'll show you, I'll show you two things and I'll read one um, as far as, you know, who are these people who believe this stuff? One is I'll show you a statement of faith from the Society of Evangelical Arminians, and 
Arminian is sort of the 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 name that's been given to folks who believe uh, you can you can fall away from the Lord and other things, and it's based off of good old Jacob Arminius's name. Uh, Joe says, I knew a pastor who had a 20 year affair with another woman and one night he died. Was he saved? Yeah, I have no idea. Um, I would say, I think that you need to, I think that it's probably wisest to look at someone's, the balance of someone's life over against one sin that he commits. Um, If a pastor, you know, I don't know, I'll leave it up to the Lord. I just, I don't know, you know, who knows? Um, The good thing is we don't have to pronounce on people's, we don't have to pronounce on people's eternal state. Um, This is more talking about if someone claims they are no longer a Christian, what should you think about that? What are we supposed to do about that? How should we explain that to to ourselves, to our friends, to, to our church? What are we supposed to think about it? So I'll show you um, the Society of Evangelical Arminians. Let me share my screen. And then I'll stop talking and you guys can tell me if you have questions so you don't, you're not sick of me. Can you see the screen? It's small. Yeah, Can't it's small. Read it. yeah. Okay, fine. Here, let me, here. Is that bigger? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is their statement of faith. And it says this. Uh, at the end. Here it is. We believe that God's, well, you can read it, but we believe that God's saving grace is resistible. And that's, that's part of the salvation discussion that we had about um, whether, how the Holy Spirit works with us to produce a a salvation decision. So we can leave that aside. Uh, That election unto salvation is conditional on faith in Christ. We can leave that aside. Uh, But this is it. Persevering in faith is necessary Uh, for final is necessary for final salvation you will not know uh, you won't know if you're a christian unless you actually um, unless you actually persevere through is this actually what i was trying to show you okay forget this ignore that i'll show you something else it's not working okay i will show you this then what what answer am i looking for here 25. Ah, okay. We'll try this again. I think I linked to the wrong thing. All right. Can you see this? Blow it up. Only if you say please. All right. Can you see it now? Yes. There. All right. Fine. There. There. Uh-huh. Better. Okay. Can a saved person ever return to a state of not being a Christian? This is the National Association of Free Will Baptists. Free Will Baptists have been around for a long time, and they're Baptists, but their distinctive is they believe in free will, meaning they um, they really emphasize our ability to walk away from the Lord, among other things. So you can tell that's their thing because it's in their name. Uh, that's always a good sign. But anyway, can a saved person ever return to a state of not being a Christian? Yes. And here's the passage Adrian mentioned, which is why we're going to talk about it tonight. Uh, um, a person can stray into, so Jesus does protect his people. So this is, this is actually the passage we're going to look at that supports our position. So yeah, Jesus keeps his people, but they can stray into sin and harden their hearts against God's convicting power to the point that you can abandon your faith in Jesus. Such a person is lost forever and without hope. So these people go even further and they say, if you do walk away from the Lord, though you can't ever come back. So you better not lose it. It's like, it's like you have one key to your car. And if you lose that one key, it's over, man. Um, You know, you're, you're, there's no spare. There's no nothing. It's, it's, it's over. So this is very harsh, but this accurately depicts what this position uh, entails. This is stronger than John Wesley, actually, but there it is. The two pastors we're going to talk about in black and white. So that's actually, that works out pretty well. What are your guys' thoughts? Well, 
my my on, on the Hebrews thing, we as we went over, you know, we discussed it being he was talking to a specific group of people. And I, you know, I, I, I have a hard time taking a couple verses out of context or and, and, and just using them as you willy nilly want to. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, if you look at the whole context of the whole letter, it seems different and pull out all these verses and chapters. It's, it, you know, it's, it doesn't seem like it's getting that specific about any one thing. I mean, especially that. And so I kind of have a hard time just listening to it in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hope we'll, we have 45 minutes left. I hope we'll be able to go through the, I really want to get the Hebrews thing and go through it today. But yeah, Hebrews is really hard. Um, and there's, I forget how many, I think there's four warning passages. It depends how you split them up. You know, Hebrews, Hebrews three and four is a warning passage. Um, Hebrews six and Hebrews 10. And Hebrews is just hard. So if you're going to reach for something, Hebrews might not be your best bet because it's so difficult to understand what he's well, saying if, in those passages. If you just keep reading that passage, he explains what he's saying. Yeah, and he says that, um, uh, let's see, verse six, and then they have fallen away. It's impossible to renew them so that they turn from their sin. As long as for that person... They keep executing the son of God on the stake all over again, which means they continually harden their hearts for, and then he gives a metaphor for the land that soaks up frequent rain and then brings forth crop is useful and receives a blessing from God. But if you keep producing thorns and thistles and fail the test, then you are um, close to being cursed. And in the end, you will be burned up. So it's a choice, but he, he keeps going on in verse nine he says, even though we're speaking this way, dear friends, we are confident that we have the better things to come, uh, better things that come with being delivered. For God is not so unfair as to forget your work and love that you showed him in the past for his service to people and in your present service too. However, we want each of you to keep showing the same diligence right up to the end. So he's saying, don't, don't forget what you have done. But I don't think he's saying that those who choose to keep crucifying christ if they were truly saved at the beginning god will still remember that but they can walk away if they want to but you can never walk out of the hand of god if he's holding you are and you those, reading from hebrews 10 uh no hebrews 6 okay i don't know that's how i interpret it yeah yeah Hebrews is, we can do Hebrews now. There was some other stuff I was going to say, but, but why not? Um, and I talked about this in Sunday school. I think we spent two weeks on, on Hebrews 6. But there, there's, three different, there's three different views people have about these passages. Hebrews 6 is, is the big one. It's the big passage. Do you guys want me to share Hebrews 6 on my screen, or do you just want to look at your own stuff? Well, I got, I got to back up here. I, we're yeah. talking about you know, can people um, lose their salvation? I, I'm following what we're talking about. But what about Matthew 13, where it talks about the parable and this, where the sower, um, you know, were they saved to begin with? Because they're, they're, they, they can fall away. Um, they, they never were saved. I mean, or... Or um, when tribulation hit them, they walked away. So were they ever saved to begin with? I mean, you kind of have to look at that, don't you, first? Yeah, yeah. And depending on what you think about the question, can you walk away from, can, can, you, can you fall away from God? You'll answer that in two different ways. If you ask me, I'll say that those people either never were Christians or we're talking about the parable. They were never Christians to begin with. That's, that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. um, if you talk to someone who believes the opposite, they would say, yeah, the person, the person has walked away from God, but he can come back. He needs to repent and God will welcome them back. That's what John Wesley said in the sermon that I sent out earlier. 
So it's, it's two, whatever you believe about this question will, will make you interpret that passages and others like it in two totally different ways. Okay. So I don't know if that's helpful or not, but this, this question is like a filter. And mm -hmm. depending what you think about this filter, you'll, you'll interpret those passages in totally different ways. So we could go to a bunch of different passages to, to talk about this question, but for sake of time, I was just going to look at the, the, the passage that each side quotes the most. And Grudem recommended this and other guys I've read recommended it also is John 10 for our side, um, the side that our church holds to and Hebrews six for the best that the other side has to offer, even though we could look at other stuff. So the, the question is, if we look at Hebrews six, does this, does this teach that you can walk away from God or not? That's the question. And Hebrews six is hard. Um, it's hard because there's so many different interpretations of it. Should I share my screen or do you guys just want to look at your own stuff? No, oh, you can share. Okay. Yeah. Well, I will do that then. Um, ah, no, I don't want that. I want this. All right. Can you see the Bible? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. So there are three, there are three different ways to understand the warning passages in Hebrews and interrupt me whenever. Don't wait for me to pause, just speak and, and run over me. It doesn't matter. Three ways. Number one is to say the people that he's warning about in these passages, the people he's directing his warning to, option one, they um, are Christians who can lose their salvation. That's option one. Option two is if you if you're a person in this in these pass in Hebrews six. And you're one of those people who walks away and crucifies Christ again and again. You were never a Christian to begin with. You were pretending you deceived yourself, uh, but you revealed your true stripes in the end because you you walked away from you 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 well you didn't walk away from God. You you just revealed your true colors and you never belonged to Him in the first place. Those are the two most common options. Whoever you read is going to take one of those two options. If Ralph gets his MacArthur Study Bible, MacArthur will take option two, and he'll take it really strongly because MacArthur's reformed. Um, if you read other people, what's that? I tore that page out. No, don't tear that page out. There's nothing wrong with Johnny, with Johnny Mac. So the third option is much less common. This is the option that my, my Greek professor in seminary uh, believed, and he persuaded me, and I, to this day, I think it's the best understanding, is that he is, the book of Hebrews is written to real Christians, and the warning passages are warning real Christians about God's, temper, God's punishment for disobedience. Just because God punishes you and destroys you like Ananias and Sapphira. That does not mean Ananias and Sapphira were not Christians. It just means they made a really, really, really bad mistake and God took their lives. I don't, I believe Ananias and Sapphira were Christians. I don't see, I don't see any reason to think that they weren't. Um, so I believe that I believe the warning passages are directed to real Christians, warning them that God will simply punish them if they first, if they, if they, be secret Christians and just go back to the synagogue and pretend to be Jewish people so to make their, their lives easier. God will punish them to up, up to and including just taking their physical life away and, and ending their life. It doesn't mean they're not Christians. Is that the sin unto death? No. Uh, I don't know. Well, you've what heard you... that. There is a sin unto death uh, passage where I've heard that interpreted as uh, the same example if, if you go on sinning long enough and God's going to say that's enough and, and you can sin until God takes you I, I don't, I don't, off the top of my head, I don't remember, I know what you're talking about, I just don't remember where it's coming from um, it's not the unforgivable sin it's yeah, just, yeah um, sure, I, I, I think I don't know where that, I don't know the passage where it's coming from, but I think the idea is I think the idea is good, I, I think Ananias and Sapphira were Christians um, who God just end of their life. Uh, I mean, I'm even willing to believe that Simon's a Christian because the way Luke, Simon, Simon Makus in Acts chapter eight, who tries to buy the 
gifts of the Holy Spirit with money. He's an immature young Christian, but he's baptized. He's accepted by Peter into the, his, into the, into the church and, and Philip. And uh, he makes a stupid blasphemous mistake. And um, um, Peter rebukes him really sharply. And everyone says he must be a false Christian. I don't believe, I think he's probably just made a Christian who made a stupid mistake because he doesn't know any better. And is just young. Um, so that's what I think Hebrews is, is talking about. Um, I'll walk through the passage so you can see, and you can decide for yourself. Um, but it's one of those three options are the two most, the two most common, um, common ones. Does anyone have any? Yeah. I was just going to say, just overarchingly, I mean, obviously the warnings in scripture are very, you know, real and pertinent. And so then you have, to um, were the apostles, were they talking to, were they preaching the gospel or were they talking to Christians or people who thought they were Christians? Yeah. Does that make, does that make sense? So it makes sense that he's, that the warnings are for people who, who either are believers or think they're believers. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. That, that, that's what I think. I mean, the, the whole book of Hebrews, he presupposes he's talking to Christians. I mean, if you look at the screen and you start in, you know, chapter five, verse 11, he's been talking about how Christ is, um, Christ is our high priest forever. And he's talking about all this deep stuff about Jesus, really deep stuff. And then he says in verse 11, you know, we have a lot to say about this topic and it's difficult to explain because you've been lazy and you haven't been listening. He thinks he's talking to Christians. They're just not very obedient Christians. He's trying to he's trying to give them a, a kick in the backside to start being mature and stop stop being tempted to leave the church and to go back to the synagogue to stop the pressure from family and friends who are trying to get them to come back. He says, although you should have been teachers by now, you need someone to teach you an introduction to the basics about God's message. He thinks he's talking to Christians, and that has to mean something. He just assumes it. He's talking to believers who are just not being faithful believers. You've come to the place where you need milk instead of solid food. Everyone who lives on milk is not used to the word of righteousness because they're babies, but solid food is for the mature whose senses are trained by practice to distinguish between good and evil. So he's sort of letting them have it, saying, you guys need to grow up. In fact, I think I preached a message on this like at my last church titled Grow Up, and it was on that passage. So who's it sound like he's talking to as we start chapter six? Let's press on to maturity by moving on from the basics about God's word. Christian. It sounds like he's talking to Christians. So, I mean, that has to mean something. Let's not lay a foundation of turning away from dead works of faith in God of teaching about ritual ways to wash with water, laying on of hands, the res resurrection for the dead, and eternal, eternal judgment all over again. You know, he said, you know, we, we, we need to move, you guys need to move beyond the basics. You should know better. You should be teaching people about this, but you, know, you guys need to move on from this baby stuff. And we, we're going to press on if God allows it. And he says, why, why should they press on? Why does he want them to grow up? Why does he want them to not go back to the synagogue like an immature Christian would. And here's the passage because it's impossible to restore people to change, to restore people to repentance. My translation tries to make it more you know, user-friendly. It's impossible to restore people to changed hearts and lives who turn away once they've seen the light, tasted the heavenly gift, become partners with the Holy Spirit and tasted God good's word and the powers of the coming age. They're crucifying God's son all over again and exposing him to public shame. So the question is, what on earth is he, what's he saying here? Um, I believe this gets really complicated, but I believe what he's saying is he's telling people who are very disobedient Christians that you can't just, you can't just disobey God and then just ask for forgiveness. He's not just going to, restore you to repentance every time you disobey him and cheapen him and go back to the synagogue and leave the church behind. Um, you've seen the light. You've tasted the heavenly gift. You've become a partner with the Holy Spirit. That's not someone who's a, who's, who's a fake. If you've seen the light, it means you've seen, you've experienced Jesus. 
you've tasted the heavenly gift. I mean, you, you have it like you've sipped it. You've become a partner with the Holy Spirit. I mean, that, that is, that's pretty definitive. The Holy Spirit only partners with you becomes only partakes with you. If you're a Christian, that, that that's it. And tasted God's good word, God's good word in the powers of the coming <clears throat> age. That I think this is talking about a Christian. The problem is, what does it mean that it's impossible to restore someone to repentance who turns away? I, either you believe that you can walk away from God, or you believe that he's saying, I think he's saying that um, God's just not going to sweep this under the rug. He's going to punish you if you if you belong to him and you just cheapen him by pretending you're not a Christian and going back to the synagogue. He's not going to take that. He's going to get angry with you. You're crucifying God's son all over again and exposing him to shame. You're basically saying that Jesus' death is nothing because you're going to pretend you're not a Christian and go back to the synagogue and pretend you're Jewish when you're really a Christian who believes in the Messiah, but you're telling everyone that's, you're, you're telling everyone that's not true. Everyone will think you've seen the light and you've gone back to the synagogue. Your friends and family will accept you back again. And the writer of Hebrews is like, no, you're, 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 it's like you're stomping, you're crucifying Christ all over again. It's worthless to you. You're, you're exposing him to shame. You're saying it's pointless. The ground receives a blessing from God when it drinks up the rain that regularly comes and falls on it and yields a useful crop. But if it produces thorns and thistles, he's saying, where's your fruit? Like, what, what, where's your fruit? If it produces thorns and thistles, which is what you're going to produce if you cheapen Jesus by going back to the synagogue, it's useless and close to being cursed. It ends up being burned. I think he's just saying, um, you know, God may even take your life. If you think it's talking about losing your salvation, you'll say it's talking about hell. So I believe it's a warning to disobedient Christians saying, don't do that. God will not take this lying down. You're cheapening everything Jesus did. And that's what I think. But I'll stop talking now. But can you at least, can you see where someone who believes you can walk away from the Lord would get that from this passage? That's, that's a real question. And poor Janine got kicked out, and I'm just now letting her back in. That section on the end where it talks about uh, the yields worse of things and, and close to being burned, uh, wouldn't that refer to the foundation in First Corinthians of uh, hay, wooden stubble versus uh, gold, silver, and precious things being tried by fire? Uh, all the worthless stuff is burned up, but still saved. Yeah. Um, one thing, Joe left a comment that Joe Grudem said that person was never saved. Yes, Grudem would. Um, remember us. Sorry, Janine, you got kicked out. I hope you. You, you missed the best part, so it's all over for you. <laughs> but um, so you know, Grudem chooses option two, Joe. So remember, there are three options. Option one is you're a Christian, but you can walk away from God, uh, which is what John Wesley believes from the sermon I sent you. He even quotes this passage like everyone does. Uh, option two is Grudem, MacArthur, and other Reformed people who say, well, this person was never a Christian to begin with, because clearly a real Christian uh, would, would, would never, real Christian would never um, turn away uh, from Jesus. And option three is these are just disobedient Christians, and Paul is warning them that God will punish them if they do this to him. Uh, so that's my answer to Joe. It depends, whatever your filters, whatever your filter is, that's how you will interpret these passages. And Grudem's filter is, and MacArthur and other good men and women, is to say, never a Christian. That's it. Um, Ralph's question is, yeah, I don't, I think the, I think the metaphor is different. Uh, it sounds like the first Corinthians three thing, uh, the wood, hay stubble versus gold, silver, and precious stones. Um, it sounds the same about the being burned thing, but they're two totally different images. Uh, in this image, it's, you have a crop, like you are, you are the field. Okay. God will water this field. God has watered the field. What fruit do we get? If you get good fruit, that's great. God will, God will be happy with the good fruit. If God gives you rain, but you produce thorns and thistles, God's going to burn the field. So he's, he's, he's warning the people who are listening. Do you want to be burned? 
Now, I don't think it's talk. I don't think it's talking about hell. I think he's just saying, you know, God will take your life. God could take your life or he will punish you. He's going to, he's going to make, he's going to judge you up to and including maybe your life being taken away. It doesn't mean you're not a Christian just means that it's over and you're, he's going to take you out of the, uh, of this life. So Tyler, is that like, um, when it talks about pruning, you know, and the branches that don't produce any fruit, they get cut off. Is that talking about a believer? Yeah, that's a good, I was hoping no one would ask that question. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I didn't, you know, I, I, I didn't have time to, to look at that like I wanted to, uh, but um, okay. When this, this is John 15 and I'll go to John 15. Jesus gives the example of I'm the vine. My father's the vine dresser. If you're a branch and you're not producing fruit, he's going to cut you off. He's going to, he's going to throw you in the fire. Um, I am not sure here if the, if the branch that doesn't produce fruit is someone who's never a Christian to begin with, or if it's just talking about temporary judgment. I, I haven't looked at this recently enough to give you my best guess right now. Um, but I can see where you like draw the, I can see where you connect the dots to it. Well, I was just actually thinking that it was a believer and it talks about trimming a branch. So it just, it seems like it's in both situations, it's talking about a part of a believer's life that is kind of just useless and God's not, God's just not gonna, you know, tolerate that. And he's going to do business with you about that. Yeah, I, I, I think that that's basically what he's saying in, in John 15, 1 to 8. Um, he's going to prune you and chop things off that don't do any good. And uh, eventually, if um, um, eventually, if necessary, he'll just cut the whole branch off and throw it in the fire uh, and burn it. Um, so Jesus is saying, you need to you need to stick with me. I think so. I, I think I'll stop sharing. Uh, the screen. I think that the Hebrews six passage is really just a warning to believers. But can can you see where someone would read Hebrews six and say, "Yeah, you can walk away from, you can totally walk away from God," and we better watch out because that would be bad. Or what do you guys think about Hebrews six? I'm not, I'm not God. So, uh, you know, you feel free to disagree with me about Hebrews six. That's a really hard passage. Hebrews 10 is the same sort of questions. And so is Hebrews three and four, where the people who disobeyed God in the wilderness, who were afraid to go into the land, were they not Christians or were they just disobedient? Well, they weren't, w were they believers or were they, were they fake believers, all of them, or were they just really disobedient? And God punished them by making them die in the wilderness, you know? Well, I think an interesting point is that in the parable of, of the land, God owns the land. One is producing good fruit and one is producing bad fruit, but he still owns the land. And I looked up why farmers burn a field. Um, and a quick answer is they burn it to remove plants that are already growing there, like thorns and thistles, mm -hmm. to help plants that are about to come up. They're prescribed burns to improve the health of the field. So, I mean, you could interpret that a couple ways too, but if you're seeing the land as the life of a Christian, then it may not necessarily be in judgment, which is what I have always been taught on that passage, but more so to restore the health of the field. Mm -hmm. If you're going to continually grow thorns and thistles, then we're going to do this the hard way versus let me till your ground and produce good crops. Um, which is the easier way. So, I don't know. Just a thought. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is this, and this is important is probably the strongest passage for this position that you can walk away from God is Hebrews chapter six. How mm -hmm. strong do you think it is? I mean, because I'll show you again, uh, where did it go? Yeah. I'll show you again. Uh, if the screen is working, I mean, you see, this is the, this is a catechism from the National Association of Free Will Baptist. This organization has been around for over a hundred years. Um, 
These are otherwise conservative faithful Baptists. And what do they reach for when they try to succinctly explain that you can give up your Christianity? They go to Hebrews, they go to that passage. This is the passage. There's a bunch of passages, but this is one of the big ones. So if this is, if this is, if you read this Hebrews six and you're like, eh, and that's the best, that's the best it can do, then you can make your own decision on how much weight it, how much, how, how, how good the position actually is. Yeah. You know, many years ago, when I was a new Christian, I was, the first things that came to me, somebody asked me that question, and I was aware of the passages where, where it says that no man can snatch you out of my hand, you know, talking about all that. And I said, well, do you believe that the Bible contradicts itself? Because in, in this sense, you just can't uh, get out of God's hand. If you're in his hand, you're in it. And even though you showed me this passage, I can't understand. I mean, I don't understand it. This is the first time I've seen it. But I'm sure if I read it in context, I'd understand it better and might make more sense than you just pointing out a few verses to me out of the context. And he accepted that because that's all I had anyway. But I knew that when he showed me that passage, there was a lot more because he, he took it out of the middle of a conversation that I wasn't aware of. So I said, I'd have to go back and study that. But otherwise, I believe that once you're saved, you're always saved. That's all I had. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And uh, your instincts are, are right. Um, and basic, uh, for lack of time, I won't go into all this, but okay. You should, you should interpret very difficult passages in light of really clear ones where there's like, you clearly understand what's being said. You understand the context and there's no, well, he could mean this. John chapter 10 is a passage that's really clear. I mean, it's, it's so clear that you, Anyone can understand what it's saying. And it's so unambiguous. Jesus says it. And because Jesus is so emphatic about this, when you come to Hebrews 6, which is not as clear and is really hard to understand, and it's hard to translate, um, I, you really need to interpret really hard passages in light of really clear ones, not the other way around. So, um, I know we're short, we're running out of time and Joe and Joan usually have to leave in about five or 10 minutes. So I, I won't spend forever on John chapter 10 because I think, I think it's clear or maybe I'm just biased, but I think it's pretty clear. And I'll close with some, some thoughts about this. I'll share my nifty screen again. Um, John chapter 10, we read this. Uh, John chapter 10, starting in verse 22. The time had come for the festival of dedication in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple walking in the covered porch named for Solomon. The Jewish opposition circled around him and asked, How long will you test our patience? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered, I've told you, but you don't believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you don't believe because you don't belong to my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never die and no one will snatch them from my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able, able to snatch them from my father's hand. And I and the father are one. Um, I don't know what to say. It's pretty, it's, it's pretty definitive. Um, he says, I have sheep. I call them. They know my voice, so my sheep always come to me. So think about that. Jesus' sheep will always come to him. Maybe they'll wander away like sheep do, but when he calls, they'll come back. Maybe it'll take some sheep longer than others because they're far away, but sheep will come back to the shepherd. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. How can Jesus give? Eternal life is a gift that Jesus gives, so how can you drop it and walk away. They will never die. This is the same group. I call them. I give them life. They'll never die. There's no, I give them life, but they can give it up and walk away. It, there's a chain. I, I call them. I give them life. They will never die. And no one will snatch them from my hand or from the father's hand. 
from either one of their hands. And I and the Father, we are one. So that it's it's like they're glued. We are glued to him. We, we are we're in union with him. Uh, we're, we're not going anywhere. And this is this is about as as rock solid of a promise, as simple and easy to understand as anything in scripture. And this is the passage that uh, that that our side reaches for to say, no. Uh, ain't no one going to walk away from the Lord. God's people will always persevere. God will keep his people. God protects his people. No one snatches them out of the father's hand. And, and that's that. So this is the passage for our side. Thoughts, anything? Well, there's a, passage in Matthew where Jesus is talking and he's talking to those who come to him in that day and he says depart from me you who do iniquity I never knew you they're trying to prove to, that they belong to him because they did uh, miracles and works and things like that he said mm-hmm. I knew you. and his passage in John he says they know me and I know them so the difference would probably be the fake Christians trying to get in uh, can't fool God, of course. You might be able to fool a few people, but I guess the sheep who are true sheep, I don't know who the other sheep are, <laughs> but it also says that we can be deceived and led astray based on our maturity. Uh, anyway, I just kind of thought of that, that there's going to be those who come who say they know him, but they don't. And like uh, we, our testimony in the last Wednesday night when Christy was there, she said she had been a member of a church for a long time and then she finally realized that she wasn't saved. So there's that, uh, going through all the motions and thinking you have it and finally realizing you don't. So there's that. <clears throat> yes. Um, you know, as, as to, to wrap up, um, and if anyone has questions, um, just interrupt me and ask them or we can talk about them next time as well. Instead, it, it's really easy to let um, popular Bible teachers and preachers drive how we think about this. And some Bible preachers and teachers have a tendency to view people who disagree with them on really important topics as heretics. Now, if you're talking about who God is, then maybe. Um, but with this, I don't, I'm not ready to call someone who believes this a, a heretic. I'd say they're, they're very wrong. But Always try and understand what is driving someone to believe something that, that, that you think is very strange, that the Bible seems to say is very strange. In this case, what is, what's driving people to say this person has walked away from God is they see people walk away from what they see people leave the church and they're trying to answer, how are we supposed to think about this? What are we supposed to think about someone who's been attending church for 20 years and has served and has done a million things and says, I don't believe in God anymore and I'm God. What do you, what are you supposed to think about this? And there's been two answers. I'm simplifying this, but I mean that there's been two answers to this question. Option one is to say, well, uh, that person is pro- was probably never a believer. And if he is a believer, he'll come back. And we need to pray for the person and pray that they'll repent. The other option is to say, yeah, the person walked away from Christ and gave up, gave up her salvation. And uh, she needs to repent and she needs to come back and God will take her back. There's two completely different ways of looking at the problem, two totally different ways. But it's all, it's, it's all coming from a real life question, not an ivory tower question from a library, but a real question. What do we think about people who say they're not Christians anymore? And depending on what you believe about this question, you'll answer it in two two completely different ways. And I believe that the, the scriptural evidence is pretty clear that if you belong to Christ, you will always be kept by his grace in him and you'll always persevere so from our perspective how do you explain someone who quote walks away from god 
we would say, I would say, a true Christian has been born again and made a spiritual child of God, which means God will always keep and protect this person. So if someone is a real Christian and they walk away or they stop going to church and seem to have no outward faith, no outward connection to church, to God's people at all, if the person's a real Christian, then God will bring her back. Maybe this week, maybe next week, maybe next month, maybe next year, maybe in 2027, God will bring the person back, but that person will come back because God's sheep hear his voice and they'll respond to him when he calls them. And if the person never comes back, likely was never a Christian to begin with. What do you do about a person who doesn't show any fruit and doesn't seem to care about God at all? The person's probably never been a Christian at all because the tree is known by its fruit. So each position tries to answer real world questions. The people who think you can walk away from God, they believe that if, if you tell someone that God will always keep you, that's like a blank check to just sin all you want, right? You'll, you'll never want to obey God because you know you got your ticket punched. And it makes people not care about God's law. And it makes people not want to serve him with their lives because they know that they have their get out of jail free card. And that's a caricature. That's cheap. I don't know any Christian that would ever, any real Christian that would ever believe that. God would never let a real Christian believe, I can just sin all I want. I mean, Paul talked about that a few times. So I think that's really cheap. People on our side do the same thing, and they, care, they, they mischaracterize those people, and they say, oh, all they care about is free will, and um, uh, they worship themselves, and they think they're in charge of their own destiny, and they insult God and hate the Trinity. Like, well, that's really cheap. I don't think John Wesley hated the Trinity or hated God. I think that's really cheap and rude. Um, but I still think they're wrong. I think they're really wrong. And I think it makes a difference as to how you would talk to someone and counsel someone and explain salvation to someone. So uh, I'll shut up now and see if anyone else has anything they want to they wanna add. But those are my uh, three or four cents, not just two cents. <laughs> Bye, Joe. Bye, Joan. Bye. Bye, guys. Well, you know, when we first joined the, the Garden Church, we were warned uh, not to go there, but because they were so, uh, they would accuse people. We can't fellowship with this group because they don't do, believe exactly like we believe. Uh, once we joined, anyway, uh, we found that we really had no problem fellowshipping with other people. However, I found it difficult to go to another denomination and sit through a service that didn't really teach what I thought, yet they claim to be believers, charismatics, uh, really uncomfortable in that uh, situation. Yet, you know, when you know these people and watch what they do, they seem to bear fruit. You know, they're bringing people to Christ, they're taking them to church, however, they're teaching all the gifts, and I had a problem with that. Uh, but so. I didn't condemn them as being lost or not being saved because I, I didn't believe the same way they did. We still have all these different denominations out there built them on one verse or another. And most of them are great people. They just have difference of opinion on certain passages. Like you say, we have to look out for heresy. You know, that really is heresy and not so much just a difference of opinion on a verse or two. So there you have it. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. What's anyone else think? Does anyone else have any thoughts? One other little thing I was thinking about when you kept showing that um, confessional or, or whatever, <laughs> was about the, um, you know, that yes, you could lose your salvation thing. It did seem like it was a, you know, continued, you know, heart. They were saying, well, let me back up. I, I made it about a third of the way through Wesley's sermon, which um, I totally get what you're saying in the sense that there is such a heart for caring about the people and that they don't miss, you know, that they aren't um, traumatized by trying to be good and not being able to do it. And I'm afraid God's going to punish them and, and whatever. Anyway, the other, but that little thing that you showed a couple of times um, where uh, um it, it, it seemed like it was a, it was a continually hardening type thing. And I guess what I was, what I was thinking was that like with the Methodist type uh, thinking where it's kind of like, if you, 
if you have any unconfessed sin, then, and you die, then you go to hell. I just think that, I mean, that's probably the, the, the real harsh part, right? Because I don't know. I think I'm getting lost in my, in my train of thought. I'm just, I think there's, there's, there's a difference. There's like a difference between somebody who's worried that, you know, you died before you confess something versus somebody who continually hardens their heart in walking away. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that's true. Yeah, definitely. I may have been all over the place on that one. Sorry guys. <laughs> Janine's so quiet today. No, I'm just thinking. Um, one of the things you said about, um, you know, people walking away from a, a church. Um, I don't think that they're walking away from God necessarily. I, I you know, I think that um, maturity came into play w in Hebrews. Uh People who are people who are, um, I think, immature tend to go away, come back, go away, come back, and then and then they start to grow. It's like a season where God is taking them. Uh, on like their own on, on, on all, their own journey it's not so much a rebellion it's just a journey uh, where they have to learn some things before they just dis decide to come back and I think in my my own journey uh, the church that I was at um, it wasn't um It, it it was a good church to a point, but it just seemed so phony. It didn't seem real. And so I, I guess I had disillusions of, or, or was disillusioned by what I believed true, true Christians look like and that everyone would be, you know, striving in the same direction to grow closer to the Lord and everybody's in their own walk. But then <clears throat> I'd see these people that were Sunday Christians and during the week, nothing was, you know, nothing changed from the world in their life. And so I left but I never left God. God doesn't like, you know, he holds you there. And so I was on this, this uh, growth. I think I grew a lot being away from a church. Um, and then I came back uh, actually after a lot of years and to this church where I met all of, all of you, Yay! <laughs> you know, and um, um, just real uh, I don't know, just real connection, real uh, Tyler, your teaching is, um, just from God. Uh, but I grew up, I, I grew, I matured more. And so it's not that I left God or Jesus. I just had to figure some things out with his help. So I was in the word, I listened to the word, um, and then decided that it was God brought me back to, to this church. So you're right. You, you go away and you come back. God, you, God, you never, if you're a true Christian, you never truly leave permanently. Yeah, that's, that's why I said that this, there are some theology classes, especially when we talk about, you know, the, like two years ago when we were doing you know, uh, the, the doctrine of Christ and we're talking about his two natures, there's some things where it can seem like, you know, this is really cold and 
you know, what's this have to do with my life? It does have something to do with your life, but it seems like way out there. This is not one of those things that's, that, that we should ever think of being way out there. And sometimes pastors and teachers and maybe even guy, theologians, men and women who write this stuff can make it seem cold. But your, your story is, is like, is the perfect example of why this is really real. You really have to, what you believe about this impacts what you think about what happens to real people in real life. Um, mm -hmm. With two minutes left, I'll tell you, um, when I think about this, I think about a guy at my last church uh, where I was a pastor who um, came to church and he'd been, he'd just gotten out of prison after seven years he never told me what he was in prison for, but he said it was very bad and I didn't need to know. I didn't care, but he came to our church, been in, he says he became a Christian when he was uh, like 11, 12 years old in a Pentecostal church and um, wasn't a very good Christian, was a bad kid, got involved with the wrong people, um, drifted through his teenage years of all sorts of silliness and, and sin, um, went to jail in his early 20s for seven years got out. He's almost 30 years old. And here he is in the church. And he comes to church all the time. He grows in the Lord. I do his wedding and gets married to a lady in the church who just escaped from an abusive relationship. What am I supposed to think about this guy? You know, he didn't get saved in a Baptist church. Oh, no. So there's that. And uh, he committed some awful crime and served many years in prison. So what am I supposed to think about this guy? Should I think, well, he lost his salvation, he walked away from God, and then he got it back uh, when he started coming to Faith Baptist Church, uh, where I was the pastor? Or does the Bible seem to say, you know, he was a Christian, he's been a Christian since he's 11 or 12, and God has brought him back and has matured, God has punished him, you want to talk about temporal punishment, God has punished him for his sins by being in prison for seven years. But God has never let him go, and God has brought him back, has kept him, kept him alive, preserved him, and then has brought him to our church so he can grow in the faith and meet this wonderful lady and get married. And then he, can, then he reconnected with his daughter from a previous marriage from when he was in, in, all, in the world and all sorts of foolishness, and he and his new wife adopted her out of foster care, and she's part of their family now, and this is years ago now, but... What do you do with this person, with this situation? And I believe this is why it's so personal. I think that God saved him when he was 11 or 12 and kept him, protected him, and eventually has brought him back. So that's why this is a real, real and that, personal. And that is so real because, it, you know, he has such a testimony to, to share with others who've walked that walk. You know, that's what it, to me that's a wonderful testimony for this man to be able to to share with other people who have been in jail you know uh to point him to jesus that there is hope